Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 58 of the Bill Podcast and in this episode we'll be going through RSpec which is a testing tool for the Ruby programming language. So even if you do not program in Ruby but are curious about uh, what is uh, test-driven development or testing, well I think uh, this episode might be useful for you as well. So the very first thing we'll do is a look at the rspec.info, which is the main website for rspec. Here you will see some of the documentation links as well as snippet of code on how to get started. Do check out the rspec gem hosted on Ruby Gems website as well, and also the three related GitHub libraries. So when you do a gem install rspec, it will come with three things. One of them is the rspec core, which kind of gives the structure such as you describe and then you write it to kind of say what the test will test for and then you have expectations which are basically matchers and lastly mocks now we will touch all the three of them so let's get started with our spec first thing we'll do is gem install our spec and once the gem is installed you will see the familiar our spec core our spec expectation and RSpec mocks being installed. So let me just create a folder called first test and get inside the folder. Now in test driven development, the very first thing we do is to write the test or rather write a failing test or a pending test. Usually when we write the test, it resides in a folder called spec or test. So let's create another folder called spec. And inside here, we will create a file called playNum, which is basically the class name that we'll create. And it will ap be appended by underscore spec to say that this is the spec file. Well, firstly, this should be inside the spec folder. So let's start describing it. So we will start with a keyword called describe and then playNum, which is basically the class name that we will implement. Now inside here, we will start describing each of the methods. So the very first one will be known as calcube. Basically, it will calculate the cube of a number. So here, let's write our very first pending test. So this is uh, pretty easy. We will say it returns a cube of a number. Obviously, this is a very trivial method we are trying to implement. Usually cubes and squares are natively found in a programming language, but hey, we do this so that it's easy for us to understand and we can focus on what our spec is. So now that we have a pending test, let's run it in our terminal. So now if we do simply our spec, notice what happens. It will give us an uh, error and say no such file. So what we should do is go back one folder up. So inside here, and there you go, it will say uninitialized constant play num. Now notice here I'm writing the test first it will give me an error and then I will write just enough code to make it pass. So let me go inside uh, the first project and now I will create a file called play num.rb which will contain the class and inside here let's write class play num and simply end. Now let's run the RSpec and see what happens. Notice it will still give us an uninitialized constant because in our spec file, the test file we need to require. So require dot slash plenum. Right, once that's done, we come back, then we run our spec again. And there you go, it says it is a pending test, it returns a cube but it is not yet implemented. Now, before we go on to implementing the full test and making it pass, let's uh, go through some of the configurations. Now, it is very useful to denote some color. And if we pass in this option dash dash color, notice that yellow means it is still pending. You have also different formats of kind of displaying the test. So one of the format is called, you can pass in say dash dash format and say documentation. Look Looks like uh, by default it was already documenting which means it will really kind of say in detail the class name, the method name and what it is supposed to do. But if you do something very minimalistic which is simply progress, another format name, notice what happens. It will simply be a little asterisk here. Now by default it is uh, kind of querying the spec folder that we have right here. But if you want you can change that path as well by simply saying 
saying dash dash default underscore path and then you can say test but in our case it is simply spec great it seems to give us the same result now wouldn't it be great if we can sort of denote all these frequently used options in a single file well yes we can that is inside a file called dot r spec so let's create this file come back to our text editor and over here i'm going to come back to this file and each of them will be basically in a new line now notice what happens next time when i try to run r spec I do not need to run all these options in the command line because it will automatically read the .rspec file and all we need to do is rspec and yep it is kind of running in the color mode in the spec folder as well as the documentation format. Great so now that we want to go on let's see what it is saying it is not implemented yet. So let's go back to our spec file because the test is not implemented. Let's implement it. So now instead of just pending, let me do expect. Now this is very readable as well, which is something that is very, very important for testing. It should be readable. So why don't we firstly initiate uh, a variable? So C equals to plenum dot new. And then let's just say C dot uh, say that's a method called calcube and you pass in three to it dot two equals it should be 27. Let's run our spec once again. Notice here this time it will say that the test is failing. One failure unlike previously which says one pending because we have undefined method calcube. Now this is one thing very cool about testing. It will tell you exactly what is wrong with it and you write just enough code to change the error message or even make it pass. Why don't we implement just enough code to change the error message? So since over here it says undefined method calcube, why don't we go ahead and define it? So I'll come here inside the method definition file and let me just say calcube and I'll simply say end. Well, it's defined, isn't it? Let's run our spec and guess what? It will say wrong number of arguments. Notice how the error message changes. So all right, so we know that it takes in a num. So why don't we just write minimal code to change the error message. Now it will say something even different. It will say expected 27 but got nil. Obviously it is nil because this function does not return anything. So it is expecting 27, right? So why don't we just return 27? And let's run our spec once again. And hey, guess what? It is passing. So notice how I wrote just enough code to make it pass. Now obviously you're thinking this is not correct, isn't it? So what we're going to do is now write another test. So let's say calcube of 2 is equal to 8. Why don't we run our spec once again? Hey, guess what? It is obviously failing because it is expecting 27. At this point, let's go ahead and implement the entire uh, function. So obviously it should return num times num times num. And now when I run our spec, notice that it is passing. Of course, if you go ahead and pass in documentation as the format, it will give you a little bit detail. But progress should do, especially if you have hundreds of tests in your uh, project. Just for the sake of demo, why don't we do a second test? And this time it will simply be cal square. So I'll just simply change it three. Here should be nine and here should be four. So now when we run this thing, our spec, notice it will say expected nine got 27. Oops, I should definitely change the methods here as well. So it should be cal square. So this is basically a new method. So let's run it once again. And there you go, undefined method, which is pretty similar to what we have uh, last time. So why don't we kind of define it, cal square, end. And of course it gives an argument. It should be num times num. And now when we run it, Notice that we have two examples and there are two little dots here. In our project, ideally we'll have lots of files like this and lots of tests. What if we want to run a particular test? In this case, we can define it by the line number. So what we can do, let's say you want to run only this single test, which is calculating the square of a number on line 14. In this case, we'll come to our spec and then the folder, play num and then colon line 14. And there you go. It will say one example. Great. So now that we kind of know a little bit about how to test, how to make it fail, pending and some configurations, let's go on to our tiny little project number two. Here we will learn about some hooks. So let me create a new folder to dash hooks. 
So over here in project number two, we will have a very similar file structure. So let me create a new file called planum.rb and I'll just copy paste the code. Let me create a spec folder as well as a spec file, which for now will be exactly the same as our first project. All right, so in the command line, let's make sure that we are in the correct project folder. So why don't we run our R spec one more time? Obviously nothing has changed and everything is working. So let's do some refactoring. And in this case, we will refactor the test code and remove some repeated lines. So especially things like planum.new is kind of repeated. In our spec, we ha you have something called the hooks. So you can execute a certain number of code just before each test. So you do that with before each and then end. Over here, with the help of an instance variable this time, we will simply do planum.new and guess what we can remove two lines now here in this case we are removing two lines but imagine with a lot of test files with a before hook you can possibly remove a lot of lines this is basically a lot of initialization of data now to make sure that our refactoring works how do we know with a click of a finger well all we need to do is run our spec well, obviously something is wrong undefined local variable or method c it even tells you the line number 11 and 18. This is a very good thing about testing. Whether you're refactoring the test file or the class file and then you want to know whether it's working, all you need to do is run our spec. So let me just come back right here and put it to an instance variable. Now when we come back here and run our spec, yep, it is all running and our refactoring is successful. So why don't we come here and just to show you something that happens uh, say before all. So to execute something that is happening before all, just as a demo, we can do start. So obviously this will only run once because this is before all of them. But if you want to do before each, so notice here I'll do a puts and each of them. If I run our spec now, there you go, it will print out two times. Now very similarly, we also have after all. And why don't we simply say done? And I'm just gonna remove away each of them. And notice here, firstly it will run the test. There you go, the two dots, and then it will say done. So using these hooks, basically before each, before all, or after each, after all, you can refactor a lot of the same repeated code into these loops. So next what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a third folder and this time we're gonna learn something about matchers. So what is a matcher? So here we are basically saying expect the method to kind of equal to something. So here we have only used one kind of method, which is equal. In our project number three, we will learn about other matchers. So the very first thing I will do is copy the entire folder and just name it as three dash matcher. So once again, it's exactly the same with the planum class file and the spec file. So next, why don't we learn about some matchers? So if we come to the expectation GitHub repository, here you'll see various kinds of matchers. So equivalence was something we have been using so far. So you can try identity, be something, or you can try comparison. This is pretty useful for numbers. It can be greater than, greater than or equal to, be within, or even some regex. Pretty useful for strings or types of classes, truthiness, expecting error, throwing error. There are seriously a lot of matchers for us to work with various kind of our code. So let's try out some of them. So let's go to the class library and over here. So why don't we say that, so here I'm pretty much going to say that num equals to three and here I'll just put it as num. So obviously we can expect when you pass in the num through the method called calcube, we can pretty much expect the num to be lesser than the answer. So why don't we run this test again? Obviously this is in the wrong folder. So let me go to folder three and let's run it. Aha, uh -huh, so looks like I got a little error. Yep, it should be C. And there you go, it's kind of wrong. So what I meant to do was expect num to be lesser than 27. So basically we are saying that the cube of a number has to be greater than the cube. So let's run it once again. And there you go, we are correct. The other thing that you can test with is uh, the instance. So we can say expect instance variable to be an instance of planums. 
run our spec once again. Yep, it is correct. And lastly, instead of instance, we can also test kind of. And yep, it's still passing. So once again, for other types of matches, especially with strings or classes or any other type, go ahead and check out the R spec expectation GitHub repository. Let's move on to project four, where we will kind of work with something called a factory. All this time when we were creating test data for our test, how can we sort of extract away all this test data to something called factories so that our test file only concentrates on testing it, not about the test data. So this time for project number four, we will create a brand new project, nothing to do with numbers. Uh, this time, something to do with users, which is very common in many web projects. So let's call it four dash factories. And inside here, as usual, the very first thing we will create is the test file. So inside the folder spec, we will create a file called user underscore spec dot arg. So here we will require dot slash user, which is not yet implemented. Then let's describe user. And inside the user, we have just one method just for the simplicity of it. So let's say describe. Why don't we say greeting? And inside the greeting, we will have just one, which is greets everyone. Great. So why don't we run the spec file? And it says there is no such file. So why don't we come ahead and create user.rb and simply class user. And inside here, we'll have a method called greeting. Great. So let's run the test file once again. And there you go. Not yet implemented. Obviously, I am missing the config file. So let me quickly create the dot r spec file let's run it one more time there you go with the color format as well as the documentation format now let me go back to the user spec and i do want to have a few more so it also greets an engineer and it also greets an astronaut so now we have three pending tests. Let's run it again. There you go. We have three pending tests. Now an astronaut, an engineer, everyone, or what I call the user roles. This is something very common in a lot of applications. So why don't we implement them? And inside greet everyone, let's create a new user. And let's give it a name, anonymous. And let's give it an occupation, say a teacher. And finally, we will say expect you dot greeting dot to equal hey anonymous what are you gonna read next let's run our spec obviously out of three examples two are pending and one is failing so why don't we go back to the user library and we need some accessors and they are name and occupation and inside the greeting method we will simply return hey concat the name what are you gonna read next and when we run our spec yep it is passing. Now here comes the tricky part when we kind of want to implement greets and engineer. Let's implement that. Right. So here, very similarly, we will do u equals to user dot new u dot name equals to limor freed and u dot occupation equals to engineer. And here we expect u dot greeting to equal ola limor freed what hardware are you building currently great so now let's run the test once again and yes obviously it is failing because it is getting the everyone string so let's go ahead and implement it very quickly and this time we will pass it through an if else loop so if the occupation is engineer you say what hardware are you building next else is for everyone and now the r spec is passing and finally if you come back to the spec file it greets an astronaut let's complete this test and i'm going to paste in something very similar to the engineer but this time chris hatfield is the name and the occupation is astronaut and it kind of greets hey chris hatfield when are you next visiting the iss and i will basically cut and paste the if else loop Right, so it will kind of detect whether the occupation is engineer, astronaut, else it's for everyone. Now, if you run the test, yep, we are all passing it. Now, this little project is all about factories. Notice here in our spec file, every little test that we have, we are kind of initiating an engineer, a reader, or an astronaut. Wouldn't it be nice if we kind of extract this away into something called factories? So for this, we will use something called a factory girl. So let's go ahead and install it first. So we'll do gem install factory underscore girl. And once it's installed, 
Let's come back to our spec file. The very first thing we will do is require factory girl. We'll come right at the top and require factory girl. And the next thing we will do is factory girl. Let's kind of do some initialization. So factory girl dot find underscore definitions. And here we will say our spec dot configure do config config dot include factory girl syntax methods. Now, if you're wondering how I know how to do all this, well, obviously I went to the GitHub and there are some very neat instructions on how to get started and include some of the initializations. So obviously all we did is kind of initialize it. So in order to use a factory, let's create a file inside the spec folder called factories.rb. Okay, so inside here, let's define it. So we will say factory girl dot define. Why don't we first define what is a user? So factory user do, let's say name. And then this time we will just say it's anonymous and occupation is a reader. That's it, as simple as that. Now, how do we use this factory in our spec file? Now, notice here, all we need to do is literally remove all of this code and just say u equals to build and then say user. The code has become a lot shorter, isn't it? Now, the way to see whether it works or not is obviously to make the test run once again. And yep, looks like it is running. And the cool thing is in the factory, you can also have various different types of factory. One being the child factory. So basically you can now derive the engineer or the astronaut user from the parent factory. So how do we do that? Let's define one more time factory. And then let's just say astronaut and we'll say parent in this case is user and in this case let me just copy paste so we will similarly say name is Chris Hatfield occupation is astronaut now imagine if our user had some other things say like age or something else here if we do not define age in our child it will simply assume the age is same as the parent factory so let me just remove the age because we are not using it but let's come back here and very similarly remove all this code that we use to initialize the test data and simply say u equals to build and this time all we need to say is astronaut let's run it one more time yep it seems to be passing now just to ensure that it is wrong we can sometimes purposely fail the test so obviously there is no astrona factory so let's run it and see whether it's failing yep there is no registered factory with this spelling so yep we, it is running the correct test and finally i'll do the very same thing with u equals to build and this time an engineer factory so once again i come back here this engineer factory will be very similar to the astronaut because it has the same parent so let me just change the names something like this now isn't it a lot neater that all your test data is defined in the factories file and all your test file only has the expect matchers as well as describing each of the tests so it's a lot modularized so let's run our spec once again and voila it's all passing so factories uh, as well as matchers and hooks are something really useful for all kinds of tests the final thing that we will do is something called stubbing so once again we will create a fresh new folder five stubs and over here we'll do something really really simple so here we will play around slightly with the stack exchange api stack overflow the website that we all love as developers so here we will basically try to call some data and it will come back and give us some data so why don't we as usual create the spec folder and then the test file in this case the class name that we will explore is question so we'll say question underscore spec dot rb right so require dot slash question inside here describe question do right so let's just have a method called count and inside here a little test which says gets the number of our spec questions from stack overflow and this idea it will be really simple r equals to question dot new and we will basically expect r dot count to be say more than 10 and of course let's implement the question class now inside the question class we will use a gem called HTT party so that we can query the API URL from stack exchange and it will give us a JSON response so let's require HTT party and more importantly, let's gem install HTT party. And now that HTT party gem is installed, let's come back to our 
file and class question. Let's do the count method. And over here, response equals to HTT party. And we will query the URL. So which is basically HTTPS, a stack exchange URL with some params, which will go to site stack overflow tags with RSpec. So just to see whether we are getting a reply back from the API, let's just create an empty array. And all we will do is just put out the titles. So let me change back to the five folder and run our spec. There's a little error and I missed a little do keyword here. Let's run it once again. Oops, there is no, oops, there is no do here. So let's quickly run this. And there you go. It is failing with one example because obviously there is no count here. So json.parse. Now we will take response.body and for each of the items, let's map it to array titles and then push in the array. And finally, let's return titles.count. There's a little error right here. We should do HTTP party.get. And now when we run our spec, hey, there you go. We have all the titles from Stack Overflow related to our spec. Now, in this case, it is not always wise to keep calling the Stack Overflow API. One of the reason is many of these external APIs have something called a rate limiting, which means we consider something more than 30 requests per second per IP to be abusive. So when you're doing testing, you will be calling these external IPs a lot of the time. And most importantly, when you call a Stack Exchange API, you're not really testing your code. You're testing the external API, which is probably not uh, the correct way. So in this case, you, what you want to be doing is stubbing this. So do not call this count, but instead kind of return a pseudo answer. So how do we stub? So let's go back to our spec file. So right after we initiate question.new, we will simply say r.stub and then we will say count. So basically stub out the count method and simply return 11 just to make this pass. And then you should also do r should receive say count and return 11. Now notice here in this case, it will not call the count method at all. Unlike all our previous test cases, and it will simply pretend that it's a black box and it will return as this number 11. So notice here previously when we called our spec, it also put out the strings of all the titles. Now, since we have stubbed it out, notice what happens. It will not put out the titles because it is not even calling the count method. It will simply assume that it is returning 11 in this case. So this is really useful whether you are doing some kind of external API calls. And that's it for all the coding examples for this week's episode on RSpec. I hope with the matchers, the hooks, the factories and stubs, as well as running RSpec very often, it gave you an insight into how test driven development works. So you write the test, you make it fail and you write just enough code to make it pass. I find it most useful when you are implementing new features because how do you know that the new features don't break the previous one? Well, in this case, just before Git committing or checking into your code into the repository, all you need to do is run all the tests to make sure every single feature that you implemented as well as the past features all pass. So let me quickly go through some of the other websites relevant to TDD or RSpec. One of them is called WebMock. Uh, this uh, library gives us a useful way of stubbing out HTTP requests and other external API calls. The other one is called email spec. So if you are testing the content of email, who is it sent to, who is it received by, email spec is another awesome library. The other one is database cleaner. Now in this uh, episode, I did not use a database to create the test data, but sometimes we do need to. At the start of every test suit, we need to clean the database so that our previous test does not kind of uh, corrode the current test data. And uh, then we also have shooter matchers, which is another uh, matcher for that can be used with our spec. And there are, of course, other websites, for example, Relish app, which comes with our spec and other documentation and also betterspecs.org, which gives us some tips on how to create or write better specs. 
or tests. Now, most of the time, if we are not using Ruby programming language natively, you might be using it with some kind of framework such as Rails or Sinatra. If you are using RSpec with Rails, which you should, by the way, I found this book really helpful, which is Testing with RSpec by Aaron Sumner. Finally, I do want to point out that the concept of testing is not alone with Ruby, as I first mentioned at the start of this episode. Uh, it goes back a long way with Smalltalk, which had a S unit a testing framework. There is also J unit, which is for Java, and also PHP, there is PHP unit, and uh, there is also something for Python as well. And also for JavaScript, there's a testing framework for Mocha and Jasmine. So no matter which programming language you do, if uh, testing is applicable for your code, so do go ahead and check out some kind of unit test. And before I go off, the build link of the episode goes to this podcast called Ruby Rocks. And it is hosted by Charles Maxwood and a bunch of other developers. This totally makes my commuting time very worthy so if you are into ruby programming language do check out this podcast ruby rocks and that's it for this week's episode of our spec episode number 58 for all other episodes you can go to build-podcast.com and subscribe via rss itunes vimeo youtube github or twitter to get your latest content goodbye